Go from welcome back to another round review on the channel. Round one of the 2024 AFL season is in the books. Every team has now played, and we saw many different types of games across this weekend. Saw some upsets, saw some teams bouncing back, saw some statements. And how about the two grand finalists from last year? I'm pretty sure I read somewhere the first time since I think the 1920s or 30s, both teams have started off the season 0-2, so it's a rare feat and it has happened, but there is plenty to talk about with each game across the span of the weekend. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you do, go on to enjoy, and let's get into it. Okay, so just off the back of streaming the Richmond and Carlton game, crazy game in the end with the Blues getting up by five points. When we look at both sides, we thought the intensity throughout the four quarters was fantastic. It was end-to-end, -end, momentum swings, so overall a good game of footy, but just the quality um, and the efficiency was really poor from both sides. If, I think if you're a Carlton supporter and looking at that, that's just a sort of a win you just want to bank the four points and move on because it was really scrappy stuff. The majority of the Blues inside 50s were just very predictable and scrappy, going just deep inside 50, not really low in their eyes, picking apart targets. When they did get opportunities when going from end to end or off the turnover in open play, just a lack of composure really from a lot of the smalls. They weren't really clinical enough. They weren't. They just lacked really a lot of poise in front of goal too and picking apart their targets. So pretty much they were just able to get a lot of their scoring from marks inside 50 or goals from stoppage. When you look at it from a Richmond point of view, well, massive respect to them. I mean, for them to still keep in the hunt, keep on fighting, they went down swinging with the outs they had. Um, you know, Tyler Young went down pretty he went down Gibkiss. Shame to see. I think he's done with an ACL. That's just terrible news. And still keeping the game. Um, I thought in the third term they were able to answer back um, and repel inside 50 injuries really well all night um, and move the footy pretty decently against the grain end to end and get some goals from it. But yeah, the Blues too good in the end and they probably should have won this game by a little bit more given that they had 15 more inside 50s and they got on top in the midfield battle in the final term. Richmond really needed the bounce back after a poor outing last week and just their overall attack around the football was much better. They were really taken up to Carlton throughout pretty much the whole game. They were able to win stoppage and get some goals off those two. Bolter posed himself as a great forward target in that third term. Dustin Martin was able to get some score involvements on the board and they just kept on responding back and throughout every main break they were in the lead apart from full time. Nick Flosson down back was sensational, one of the best for Richmond on the night. Just his intercepting ability was tremendous. The chase down tuck on Charlie Kerno. It has to be said, if he wasn't playing tonight, I think Richmond would have lost that by probably over 30 points. He was immense for the Tigers and Taranto really grew as the game went on. But yeah, just really in the dying moments of the game when they still had chances, just their kicking forward sensor was awful and their entries were really poor and ultimately in the end I think the professionalism of the Blues defence was really good. Brody Kemp, Lewis Young were solid down back and they've been training in these scenario situations from, from what I've been hearing in the preseason and looked like it paid off. Um, yeah, just I felt they set up in defence really well in the end to hold on. Paddy Cripps was my best on ground for sure with the three votes and Mentz in the midfield was able to, yeah, just really win those hard balls that the goal assist as well to Adam Chera for the snap that was great too um, in the goal square as well. Uh, for my two votes, I'm going to be going with Harry Mackay. Fantastic again tonight. Um, it was sensational again in the air. They were sort of struggling the Blues when going inside 50 and they were just bombing it along again. But, uh, you know, eventually they were able to find a Mackay mark here or there and his goal kicking was great. He flushed that one from outside 50. Um, I think it was one of the highest rated players on the ground as well. And then for one, my one vote, I'm going to be going with Nick Vlosten. Got to give this guy his flowers. He was sensational for the Tigers tonight. But uh, yeah, from both ends, really, really just scrappy stuff. The Tigers were able to make the Blues pay throughout the three quarters, but just couldn't get it done in the end. The Blues defended well enough in the end. The intercepting game was great too, um, and they'll head into round two with a 2-0 record. Next up, we had the Pies versus the Swans. What an emphatic victory from the Sydney Swans. I've still got my Swans jumper on just off the back of streaming the game, uh, but just a brilliant victory from Sydney. Professional, defended so well as a back six, but ultimately their ball movement and classiness and just toughness around the footy and pressure and turnover game was key in their win for sure.
Pies obviously disappointing last week. They just weren't tough enough around the footy um, and didn't really front up collectively as a midfield unit. And defensively, um, they were very, very disappointing. So heading into this game, I was expecting them to show more fight, I think, at the footy and really improve their intercepting game. But it was just the same tale. They got completely outplayed by a better side. Going inside 50, the Swans are very much way more neater than Collingwood again. Collingwood having their issues going inside 50, lack of tall service from the tools. I thought Cox, he was better than then than last week, but still overall not good enough. And Johnson was very disappointing too. There wasn't really much to like for Collingwood on the night, apart from, I guess, Nick Dacos. Um, he had a sensational individual game once again. I think he had about 36 disposals and a goal to his name. So he's a good chance to pick up a brand low vote. And in the end, it was just all Sydney, pretty much. Just how they're able to control the game was so much better than Collingwood when moving the footy end to end. There were many times throughout the game where the ball was in congestion quite a bit in the corridor. Who was going to win it? I just felt the Swans were way, way more tough with the likes of Robot and Heaney and Chad. They were just fronting up to the contest much better than the other Collingham mids like Dugowie and Crisp. Um, and they were just able to get it forward much better. They were cleaner as well in the congestion when getting those exit hand passes out. And yeah, just their end-to-end -end ball movement was fantastic. They were hard and tough on the inside and so clean and classy um, on the outside. And we're just really dominant for four quarters. It was a bit of a shaky start from them. Collingwood um, were able to get two goals in a row after the Swans first, but they still were in control for pretty much the whole game. All in all, the complete performance from the Sydney Swans. Uh, they just defended so well as a back six once again. The intercepting game was so strong. They scored 78 points from turnover. That's an insane stat. That's what wins your games and potentially down the line flags. Turnover game, so important, but everybody played well for, for sure for the Swans. For my votes, Isaac Heaney for me, again, best on ground. Just how he moves in congestion. He was, again, so clean tonight. He was able to impact forward and also in the centre. Um, and yeah, just work ethic, brilliant. Uh, he definitely was clean tonight. For my two votes, I am going to be going with Chad Warner. Um, he was disappointing the first half of last week against Melbourne, but he fronted up with a way better consistent four-quarter effort. Um, again, he was just fronting up with, with just really strong physicality play. He was breaking tackles, getting the football forward. That's the Chad Warner we know and love, just tough in the cold face. And for the one vote, I am going to be giving my flowers to Nick Dacos. He still had a really good individual game 37 touches he had a ball in the string he was able to win clearance really early on uh, but that's really the only positive note tonight for Collingwood poor defensively the Swans run a muck against them physically mentally tougher in the game turnover game elite pressure elite four and a half turnovers very very good too and yeah the Pies just again really sloppy with their foot skills uncharacteristic performance once again from the Pies but the Swans too good and won in the end by 33 points could have won this game by more for the Saturday games now, first one up, we have the Bombers get the win over the Hawthorne by 24 points. Well, quite simply, backing is bad football when you look at it from a Hawthorne perspective. 11 goals, 17 to 17 goals, 5. Both sides had the swing of momentum throughout the games. It was a bit of a free-flowing affair when going end-to-end. -end. There was plenty of that. Um, and it was around that second and third term where Hawthorne were getting those repeated entries. Now, they could have been up genuinely by a few goals at half-time, but just their execution in front of goal was really disappointing. Chol was missing a few, uh, and just their overall and open play shots at goal, really, really poor stuff. And that third term, Essendon were able to make Hawthorne pay. In the Premiership quarter, Essendon kicked five goals straight from only 11 inside 50. So some of these defensive problems we were aware of heading into the round did pose to happen for the Hawks today. There still was Hawthorne positives in the first half, getting the repeated entries and winning it around the footy. But just as that second half wore on, they just got outdone in the midfield. With the absence of Parrish, Zach Merritt and Setterfield and Archie Perkins, one of the best players on ground, really rose to the task. And they were just able to outwork those Hawthorne midfielders when moving in in transition. Very effective off the stoppage too. I think they kicked about seven goals, one from stoppage. So they got really on top in those areas and just their efficiency really won them the game. Always getting those goals against the grain and making Hawthorne pay for their mistakes. So overall, I thought Essendon's blend of young players like Archie Perkins and also their sort of leaders and experienced players really got to work and collectively put in a great effort today. You know, players like Langford and Andy McGrath from halfback was roaming free. For my best on ground, I'm definitely going to be giving it to Archie Perkins for sure. 12 tackles, 24 touches, 2 goals. Not only was he tough um, in the coal face, but he's also able to break free, hit some nice targets, and he was just really clean 
um, when he was in their Ford 50. For my two votes, I am going to be giving it to Jake Stringer. Um, his first game in 2024 was an absolute beauty, slotting home four goals one. Um, he was dangerous, especially um, in those moments where Essendon needed to respond back with goals. And for my one vote, Zach Merritt uh, had the ball in the string once again today. Um, and then some of his kicking, like normally, was brilliant too. So, yeah, I think it was just a young Hawthorne side. Um, their inaccuracy hurt them and just got outworked in that final term as the leaders really stood up for Essendon to get a 24-point win. And then the next game up, we had the Giants get a big win over the Kangaroos by 39 points. A really gallant North Melbourne effort, I must say. Um, we were all expecting them to go down probably by quite a convincing margin against probably the best-looking team in the competition on how they move the football. And I thought North, in terms of attacking, were able to somewhat match that. I uh, really like the North ball. They're trying to bring in a lot more forward hand passing. Um, they were able to get some nice goals from transition. And their clearance game, especially in that second term when they kicked the six goals straight, um, they were able to really um, punish GWS off the turnover um, in, in transition too. Because if you can get those goals quickly at the back, um, you know, some players like Whitfield float forward. They are able to get some goals, generate some opportunities off that. So it was a credit to them. But... Well, let's be honest, we're all expecting GWS with their class and their cohesion and their chemistry to really get the job done and put the foot on North, and they did. North's defence woes uh, heading into this game were definitely going to be a concern. It was all Pink Dawson and Cole's very first game as a trio together in an AFL game, so it was expected they were going to struggle a bit uh, when defending inside 50, and again, the Giants so classy, just like last week against Collingwood. Jesse Hogan was again sensational, booting home six goals. His set shot at the moment is just such good style. Um, it's really giving him confidence, and he's a really hard player to defend in the air. His contested clunks were very good today, and again, just the collective effort from the midfield. Tom Green uh, was my best on ground once again, uh, just racking up the footy, kicking goals. He's definitely going to be up there for the Brownlow medal, uh, and then for my two votes, I am going to be going with the great man of Jesse Hogan. Just talked about him. Uh, 165 super coach as well. So he was really, really efficient in front of the big sticks. Could have honestly had eight with six goals too. And then I'm going to be giving my love to Sam Taylor for my one vote. Um, he was brilliant, especially in the first 20-minute period against um, Nick Larky. Larky was able to get the better of him throughout stage of the game, but just such a tough player one-on-one. -on -one. And he just showed throughout that game why he is probably the best key back in the comp. Overall, a really gallant performance from North. Um, their offensive style, I really do like heading into this year. I think, you know, kicking 82 points against GWS, very, very good. Um, I thought they were able to put the Giants under the pump with some efficient use as well um, with goal kicking and going inside 50. Uh, but yeah, the defense is always going to be um, a bit of an issue and the Giants exposed that quite well when going inside 50 and transition game again was very strong from their D50. So the Giants with a convincing win over the Kangas. For the Saturday night games, first one up, the Cats and the Saints. We were treated to another inefficient battle. We've seen plenty of these across the span of the weekend. 10 goals, 16.76 to 9 goals, 14.68. This game was in the balance throughout pretty much the whole four quarters, it must be said. Geelong ended up winning the inside 50s and they won the count by 18. But just throughout the game, the momentum swings, which it was really arc to arc threat pretty much the whole stage of the game. We'd see repeated entries for a 10 minute patch from St Kilda and then Geelong were controlling their forward half, but ultimately from both ends of the ground, no one could just kick straight. Um, and as well, just the lack of chemistry and cohesion was showing, especially for the Saints' um, point of end. Like when they were going inside 50, they just lacked a lot of composure. You know, Jack Higgins, when the ball hit the deck, he was trying to do a little bit too much. A few of those smalls were struggling a little bit. And then on the other side of the coin, in that third term, Geelong go on and kick zero goal six in the Premiership quarter. So. It was a terrible, terrible day in, uh, for the office for both teams when kicking for goal. For the majority of the night, the Saints were able to get on top of the stoppage. And when that fourth quarter began, the midfield started to get on top and get those repeated entries. But just the same old stuff happened. Long bombs inside 50. They go to ground, but there were just no winners. There's not many winners at half forward for the Saints. So I felt the smalls were disappointing tonight for St Kilda and not being able to hit the scoreboard well. Tim Emery fought really well in the air, but then Max King kicking two goals for. We talked about Higgins, where he was a little bit erratic tonight as well. So it's really what let them down in the end, the Saints, uh, and just how they gave up momentum there and the classness of the Cats on being able to put on scoreboard pressure at the right time. 
pretty much won the game in the end. They were finally able to kick straight and put it out of the Saints' reach, we all thought, with being up by 19 points with around six minutes to go. And then all of a sudden, the Saints know how to kick. They kick three quick ones. Game's back to within a goal. And then some panic kicking out of the fence, which I felt the Saints did a little bit too much of tonight. Dangerfield marks. He kicks a winner. Uh, I mean, he was a, a, an absolute jet tonight, Paddy Dangerfield. I think he had about nine or eight inside 50s. Led the game for contested possessions and clearances. Uh, he was game-changing again on being able to break through the congestion and get it forward for the Cats. Of course, a disappointing loss for the Saints, but again, they were pretty gallant. Just efficiency really let them down. I see a lot of upside in this team um, if they can aim. If they're able to, you know, be a lot more efficient with their forward half turnovers and use inside 50 heading into the next few weeks, I think they're a great chance against the Pies. Watch out. Um, but it just, yeah, the goal kicking really let them down tonight. A key part to Geelong's forward 50 was the unlikely youngster of Ollie Dempsey was really the game changer uh, in their forward 50. His ability to take marks, work high up the ground, hit some targets inside 50, but ultimately hit the scoreboard when the Cats needed him the most. Three goals won, 15 touches, seven marks. Uh, he covered the ground really well tonight, um, and I think he was an unsung hero for sure. Darcy Wilson was big in the second half. He grills the game, went on kicking two goals. Rowan Marshall again showing why he's a terrific ruckman, taking those important marks down the line and in the hole. But in the end, when the team needed to stand up, you just can't go past Geelong's forward half classness and their ability to win it out the middle. They got on top of that midfield battle late. Their forward half got to work at the right time and were able to put on the scoreboard pressure enough to keep the Saints at bay and get the first win of the season by eight points. For my best on ground, for three votes, I'm going with Paddy Dangerfield. Talked about him earlier. Um, yeah, sensational game from him. Uh, yeah, just really game-changing with his ability to break free and get many center clearances for the Cats, as he always is very good at. And for my one vote, uh, I'm going to be giving my love to Rowan Marshall. Um, yeah, really, really good after quarter time. He was huge on uh, just taking those important marks and being a key part in the Ruckman um, and could have, kicked a, could have kicked a goal as well. So, yeah, there's my best on. And Cats get it done by eight points in, again, another scrappy game of footy. Meanwhile, in the other Saturday night game, we had the Suns get a very narrow win in the end over the Adelaide Crows. Now we're just playing the conditions much better. Gold Coast and heading into the final term with a pretty convincing lead. We all thought, all right, this will be game over. Suns with another good-looking win. Uh, and then Adelaide going to kick five goals in a row. Rochelle kicking a snap, and they're all up and about. They got a quick one from the centre bounce with Isaac Rankin out the back. We think, oh, no, are they going to be choking here? But they do hold on and narrowly win by a straight kick. And in a way, you could probably say football justice does play its part in the end because for the most part, Suns, just their ability to control their game for the majority of the night was much better uh, than Adelaide, especially throughout the second and third terms. Adelaide were getting very limited inside 50s, whilst Gold Coast were able to keep it majority uh, for the most part in their forward half. Key part of the Suns' win for sure was their ability to play much better to the conditions. They were cleaner in the cold face and they were just a lot less panicky when uh, going by foot. There were a lot of just... Hacky kicks by Adelaide out of the defence and some poor turnovers too. There was also a lack of discipline as well. Brody Smith putting Holman in a headlock and giving away a 50 medal penalty and a goal in the end proved costly. The absence of Taylor Walker really did hurt the Crows when going forward. Just scrappy ball movement. Were struggling to get many winners inside their forward 50. Um, and yeah, for Gold Coast, pretty much controlling all night. Um, I thought their ball movement, they were able to be a lot cleaner too when going through the corridor. And with being up by 39 points at three-quarter time, they really should have put the game to bed. But I guess credit to Adelaide. Uh, they were able to get a bit of a surge through the middle, get the inside 50s, and finally find the winners through Rochelle, through Rankin. Uh, but it just wasn't to be as Gold Coast did hang on. I thought, again, their defense, um, for the most part, was pretty rock tight tonight. Ballard, I really liked in the air, and also Will Powell. thought his intercepting game was really good on the night as well. But ultimately, in the end, it's just that Gold Coast mid field core that's going to cause a lot of havoc for some teams. Sam Flanders, Anderson, Rowell and Tuke Miller all had over 28 disposals and were key parts on getting the ball forward. So the Suns, more clean aside, thought their structure around all lines of the ground were much better than Adelaide's for the most of the night. Really should have just kept this result at bay and probably won by more. So good win for the Suns. They move to 2-0. For the Sunday games now, we had Melbourne get a huge win. In the end, they really ran away with this one over the Bulldogs by 45 points. This one was a little bit in the balance early on, but Melbourne were able to kick, I'm pretty sure, five goals in a row and control the game pretty much and keep the margin at arm's length. A lot of positive signs for the Demons today. I thought they were just able to bring back their strong DNA and brand into this game. 
defense and contest I thought was superb today for Melbourne. They defended really well as a back six, limiting scores per inside 50. Stephen May had probably one of his best games. Uh, it was really, really good in the air and one-on-one. -on -one. And then in the midfield too, uh, Petrarca, Oliver, back to his best. He was fantastic in the guts today. Maxi Gorn as well, uh, taking marks, just being able to float around the ground and make a huge impact. And where Melbourne really improved on from last week is I really liked their ability to move the footy with a lot more pace. That really caught out the Bulldogs' back six. They are not only able to use the width of the MC, CG quite well. They had a lot of marks, Melbourne. I mean, looking at the team stats, they had 141 to 99. 141, quite a high number. So they used the width of the MCG really well, but they're also able to come through the corridor and, um, yeah, just a transition and their ability as the game wore on to get on top of the midfield with the strong contest game that they do really pride themselves on. They got on top and much more efficient shots of goal this week for the Ds for the most part. A lot of contributors, which is what you want to see with the Melbourne forward line. Van Rooyen with three, Chandler three, Pickett two, Neil Bull and two, Ben Brown two. The worst stages throughout the third term of the Doggies maybe sneakily getting back into this game with responding with a goal back, but they just weren't able to really penetrate inside 50. I guess Hugo Hagen was really posing himself as a strong target inside 50, but that kicked a few points in a row in that last term. And just the leadership, the heads really dropped, I think, for the Bulldogs. Again, defending transition and ball movement. Their issues from last year, it was god-awful today. They really struggled as a back six. Um, even players like Bontempelli was really quiet in the second half. And sort of that bottom six range for the Bulldogs today, really disappointing. I thought McNeil um, and also Vandermeer were really, really poor teams today. So look, McRae and also Sam D Darcy have heard have been quite good in the VFL, so they probably do come in next week. Uh, but yeah, really, really poor stuff from the Doggies today as they just got outdone in that midfield and unable to defend ball movement as the Ds. Much need a win. Good contributions from everybody. Ford half was really humming today and they got a big win in the end by 45 points. For the next Sunday game, we have Port Adelaide get the job done over the West Coast Eagles by 50 points. And it felt like we were going to be heading into this one to witness an absolute bloodbath. But I must say, West Coast came into bat and I thought their effort was very, very good. Um, I think if you're an Eagles supporter, there was certainly some good throughout the day that you probably would have witnessed. Especially in the third term, West Coast's ability to match the physicality I thought was good. They are able to have some nice scoring chains end to end. And they, for patches throughout the game, were able to get on top of centre bounces and um, threat clearances as well. Harley Reid, I thought his debut was, was quite quite decent. Um, he was attacking the footy well, got some nice touches, had that goal assist early on. Campbell Chesser made some nice impact at the sub. Gimby was throwing his weight around as well, playing a little bit on the outside too. Um, I mean, even Bailey Williams was uh, racking up the clearances too. Uh, but we all expected Port Adelaide to get a convincing win, and that's for sure what we did witness. It was 16 goals, 24. So I guess the scoreboard in a way probably flattered West Coast, um, but yeah, their field kicking was marvellous today. I mean, Dan Houston was certainly one of the best players on field. Um, his ability just to pick apart targets throughout the field was brilliant. Kane Farrell as well with his left boot, just the foot skills and how Port were able to methodically work their way up the ground was definitely their highlight from the day. Getting a lot of goals from nice free-flowing ball movement, moving it end-to-end. -end. It was the usuals, of course, for Port Adelaide. Connor Rose, Zach Butters were very good around the ground and moving the football. Uh, Ollie Wines had some nice cameos and even a few of their role players like Miles Bergman. He was applying some great pressure on the footy, had some great moments too. Dixon was clunking, felt like everything in their forward half. And just overall, uh, you know, just sort of the ticking the ticking the boxes sort of performance from Port. Um, they did impress and they got the job done. No injuries. Their recruits played well. I thought Zerk Thatcher and Radaglia had some nice intercepts in the air. And of course, Ivan Solder, his debut game was really good. He was rated the highest player out in the ground. Two goals, four in disposals, 28 hit outs. Was also picking up those clearances too. Really liked his physicality around the ground. So great performance from Port Adelaide in the end by 50 points. Plenty of positives to take out of it from a West Coast perspective. But of course, the power at home, too good. And for the final game of the round, we witnessed an absolute ball over in Perth as the Dockers kick off their season on a high note with a really strong win over the Brisbane Lions by 23 points. The first time since the 1930s that both grand finalists from last year have started off the season 0-2. So alarm bells starting to ring a little bit from Brisbane. They started off the first term really well. Um, they got the game on their terms. Their turnover game was really good. Some of their slick ball movement was coming into pay and punishing Fremantle's mistakes. 
But I don't know what the message was um, from Justin Longmuir at quarter time because, wow, how Fremantle were able to turn that game around was just fantastic. It all started in the midfield for sure. Players like Sarong and Brayshaw and Nat Fife, he had a great game. Hardy Young too. Luke Jackson as well at ground level. They were really applying some strong heat and they got on top of the clearances and especially around the stoppage. And alongside getting on top of their midfield, it was just the manic pressure around the ground. Just the tackling ability collectively from the Fremantle players really started to ramp up. They put Brisbane under the pump and they were able to knock home through six goals in a row throughout the second and third term and keep the Lions goalless for almost an hour. And with that manic pressure, geez, the Brisbane Lions did look flat today. Uh, I thought their midfield got well outbeaten as the game grew on, like Zorko and McCluggage and... Dunkley, they just weren't able to really rack up the possessions and they weren't able to win it forward more. Fremantle were just controlling the ball throughout the second and third term so much better when chipping it around the ground. There was just no spark for Brisbane. That's always been a bit of an issue for them. Their probably inability to swing back momentum their way. And for the remaining three quarters of the game, it just really was all Fremantle on their ability to win clearance, get it forward. And geez, their forwards did have fun tonight. Jai Miss was fantastic in the air with a big bag of four goals. Josh Tracy with three. Luke Jack Jackson was really good floating forward and taking some report marks. He kicked two. They were brilliant for a mental, but unfortunately it did come at a bit of a cost with a bit of carnage on the field. Uh, the young 21-year-old Carl Warner, a nasty concussion. Oscar McDonald looked like he had a bit of a hyperextension in his knee. He unfortunately came off. And then Brennan Cox, he swung forward. Um, hopefully he hasn't severely hurt his uh, hamstring like he has in the past. So, yeah, that could be some personal issues for Fremantle heading into the future. But, I mean, from this game today, they were just remarkable. Um, I just loved their ability to move the footy. Their pressure was brilliant. They put Brisbane under the pump. And this is what I said in my tipping video. If you're able to really bring manic pressure against Brisbane, um, you know, put the game out of their terms, you can really get on top. And that's what Fremantle certainly did. Their midfield was brilliant. Sarong was just a superstar. 46 touches for him. Um, I just love his ball winning ability. Um, he's just got such a clean knack for getting a ground ball and just cleanly distributing it out to a teammate. Um, he just was insane. My best on ground for sure. But Fremantle, too good. 23 point margin. They kick off their season 1 0. So, everyone, there was my thoughts and me having a yarn about round one of the 2024 AFL season. I try and keep these sort of reviews condensed as possible. I don't like to talk too much, otherwise, this video would be very, very long because there's plenty to talk about from each game. So, maybe comment down below um, and let me know what you did think of the round as well. Add in a few comments that I might have missed on, a play that I didn't talk about. Um, I'd love to hear your opinions down below in the comments below. Hopefully, you did enjoy. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you did. And apart from that, I will talk to you later. See you later, fellas.